Welcome to another edition of Politics Done Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Today, we are honored once again, continuing our series, A Better Human Story. With us today is Dr. Andy Bartschmuckler, PhD, a prize-winning author, former Democratic candidate for Congress in Virginia's very red Shenandoah Valley, former talk radio host, summa cum laude, graduate of Harvard University, PhD, Award with distinction in a program specially created to accommodate his original theory explaining how civilization has developed and a frequent columnist in newspapers throughout our country. Welcome to Politics Done Right once again. Dr. Schmuckler, how are you doing today? I'm doing okay. Well, as a part of this series, today we're kind of coming to reality uh, with regards to... uh, the battle between democracy and fascism in America, and how is it represented within our Supreme Court? Your thoughts? We have a crisis about the Supreme Court, and um, the American public apparently is aware that there's problems, um, but they're more profound than the way we're generally talking about them. The there's a lot of awareness about the sort of uh, the smell of corruption uh, of an ordinary sort uh, with Justice Thomas and and his billionaire benefactor. And um, with I, in my mind, that's a symptom of things that are much more per, of the moral bankruptcy. Uh, but the in the larger picture, the nature of the battle. Uh, over the Supreme Court is shown by the fact that this court is, I believe, unprecedented in its being essentially an extension of a political party. And rather than uh, a representative of the force of the rule of law, and this can be documented by looking at their decisions, which um i think are conspicuously bad law there were past times when uh the supreme court did scandalous things uh the slave power uh ha- had its way on the supreme court in the dred scott decision in 1857 which helped lead the way to the civil war uh the the civil, the, the the same issue of uh representing white supremacy uh, the court did in 1896 in a decision called Plessy versus Ferguson, where they adopted the obvious fiction of uh, uh, of um, separate can be equal, you know, consigning uh, African Americans to second class citizenship for another more than a half century. So there are dark times, but I've never, I don't think there's ever been a court that on issue after issue, acts as an instrument of the Republican Party that put them there. I'm not a constitutional scholar, but I've been paying attention to this stuff. Is They have made themselves part of a fascistic force. It's not just that they represent a party finding some harebrained way of justifying coming up with a conclusion that the Republican Party wants on guns or on abortion, you know, whatever. Not only that, but they come up with with arguments that just don't hold water. And in one case, uh, uh, a couple years ago, uh, um, there were sort of back-to-back decisions in which they used one way of looking at uh, what should be given weight to reach one conclusion, but rejected that way of looking at it to reach the other conclusion. The the complete lack of integrity at a moral level uh, of this court could be found with the Republican major five to four majority uh, pre-Trump in things like uh, uh, the voting rights decision that uh, in, in Citizens United that actually comes out and says the absurdity 
the patent absurdity, oh, that all this money isn't going to have any influence on on elections or on policy, that it's perfectly safe to open the floodgates to money. I mean, they're not stupid. They're corrupt. They're morally bankrupt to be able to say that about what they were doing, opening those floodgates. It, any fool would know that what they were saying was false, and they're not fools. And, and then uh, the Voting Rights Act was another one back from the same era when when uh, First, Obama. Uh, Section four. Yeah. Uh, you know, that uh, the, that there had been certain protections in place that had been put there in order to protect African-Americans from the impulse of the white power structure in the recent decision stripping that stuff away, the court once again says what they'd have to be fools to believe, that these states, we don't need to provide these protections anymore. That was for an earlier time. As soon as they took those protections away, uh, what was it, North Carolina and Texas almost overnight, you know, started uh, trying to disenfranchise the people that the uh, the Jim Crow regime always tried to keep from having a voice. And it comes second nature to, to destroy the democracy by disenfranchising black people and by giving the plutocracy more and more power. I think they're also doing severe damage to the structure, the, the, the structured manner in which decisions are made. Because what we've seen with the last the last several decisions is they pretty much thrown precedents out of the door, out thrown precedents out the door. And in doing so, it seems like what it creates is not sort of a laissez-faire Supreme Court, but a, 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 a body of laws that no one can take seriously any longer because it has no stay in power going forward. Today, well, maybe because it's not credible. Something else. It's just a rationalization for power. It's just raw power operating. It's not. It's not the rule of law. I mean, the, the rule of law does not justify what they did in those cases we were talking about. The rule of law would. You know, and, and the Second Amendment, for example. I mean, I remember when a Nixon appointed Chief Justice. Uh, what was his name? Um, um, Berger, Warren Berger. Uh, after he, he was Chief Justice, he said he said that the position that the, what the framers intended with the Second Amendment was that everybody, uh, every individual was entitled to uh, un unrestricted uh, rights to bear arms is a, an absurdity. Now, I don't know if absurdity is too strong, but I am pretty sure that what this Supreme Court in Heller, the case called Heller, decided about the Second Amendment was pure fabrication. It was a misreading of the intent of the uh, 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 of the uh, of the founders. You know, the, the beginning of the Second Amendment is, you know, a, a something rather uh, militia uh, being uh, uh, key to the uh, uh, free freedom or whatever. It refers to militia. You know, this, these people did not waste words. Militia had a meaning. Militia was on their mind when it had to do with the rights of the citizens to bear arms shall not be infringed. I think I'm, I'm not positive about this, but I think any honest reading would say that what they've done with the Second Amendment is something like the absurdity that the Republican appointed chief justice declared it to be. So they're handing down decisions as an exercise of power. That's what it is. We've got the majority. We're going to get what we want. That is the heart of the problem of civilization. We've talked about the spirit of the gangster. The rule of law was supposed to be the alternative to that. You know, the... the the Athenians say that the way of the world uh, is the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. Now, the whole idea of justice is that that's not to be the way things get decided. We're going to the, the job is to pass just laws 
And of course, not only just laws get passed, but it's something. It's our best. It's the best shot we've had. We pass just laws and then we have the law govern our conflicts. That's our best shot at solving the problem of the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. Fascism is about enshrining that. It's a kind of a tyranny of the few over the many. That's what you get, the Athenians understood. If you don't have some issue of right that governs the conflicts, what we've got now in this Supreme Court is not that it's a check against power, like the law is supposed to be, but it is simply an instrument of power. And that puts we who will care about American democracy in a real dilemma, because fascism already now owns the Supreme Court, not necessarily permanently, but that, that territory has been lost by the side of the democratic forces. We could talk about why the democratic forces were not better at protecting itself, themselves. That's a different conversation. We've had that before, actually. But in any event, fascism now owns the Supreme Court. So do we respect it, which is the American tradition, which is fundamental to the way American democracy has been working since Marbury versus Madison established the role of the Supreme Court as being the last word? They get the last word. And they don't have an army to enforce it, but what they've got is our willingness to respect it. But we can't respect it now. Not when they now, be, okay. When you talk about we can't respect it now, first of all, I think the Supreme Court is, you know, we we for some time talk about the three legs of the government, the the um the three, the three depart. What 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 is it called? The Br branches. The three branches of government and, and their co and their co-equal branches, etc. They're not really. Nine people uh, have the power to put anyone in check, and the only the only re recourse is impeachment, which in a polarized country is almost impossible. So um, it, it was set up. It was set up in the hopes that the process. I mean, you need to have somebody who has the last word. So the question is, how do you set up a government where you get elected presidents, elected members of Congress uh, who have powers, but we save ourselves from the abuse of powers? And they set up this thing where the president's supposed to nominate somebody. The Senate is supposed to advise and consent and then vote on whether that person and it's, it's the best they could come up with to create what they envisioned in the absence of God coming, you know, giving us uh, messages on Mount Sinai. This is supposed to be the best thing we can do to fill an absolute need, which is to decide what does the law allow. But interestingly, why the Supreme Court has become is just another branch of Congress, right? I mean, if you take a look at it, given that it's now political, it's really not a third and independent branch. Well, um, I, I, I don't I, the branches are not quite relevant here. Um, I mean, they're not centrally relevant. They've perverted a branch, what's supposed to be a branch, which has its own safeguards and such. Uh, they've made it into part of a force. So we, you know, between Trump and the Trump Party and and, and these six Republican appointed uh, justices, there is a coherent force, which is uh, the force of fascism, which uh, basically owns the Republican Party. Didn't used to, but over the last generation, it is a great graduate. And we've talked about that in the past, you and I. This has become an unprecedented political party. And it has given us an unprecedented Supreme Court that is not worthy of being given the respect that our democracy tells us we're supposed to give it. But interestingly, let, let, let me let me challenge you now, because um, uh, for, for too long, I think we have been singing glory, glory, hallelujah to the perfection of our three branches of government. 
uh, checks and balance and all of that. And I think we've fooled ourselves for so long that we started to believe what we were saying, not realizing that to hold these three branches of government, the expectation was that there were gentle people. We used to say just gentlemen, but that there were gentle people who were going to hold up the end of the bargain, but not realizing that within the letter of the law proper, the, the, the demise of these systems are present. And I think I, I think until we come to that realization and acceptance that the demise of our system is actually written within the, the Constitution, written within our laws. That, no, I don't buy that. That in itself is a problem. Well, it, we are living it. Well, let, let me say th this about that. Um, you know that my better human story is sort of comprehensive. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it takes a look at the huge dilemma a species will face, unanticipatable, if it crosses into civilization, if it, if it leaves the natural order. So if, from my perspective, the world, the history of human civilization is filled with a lot of darkness and ugliness. And, you know, and I say the ugliness we see in, uh, Human history is not human nature writ large. That's one of my biggest points I want to get across. So in that context, where you see our system as being sort of inherently corrupt, yeah, I mean, everything I see in the history of civilization is deeply flawed in terms of power relations. But if you look at, say, how American society has unfolded, uh, and the kind of society, for example, that my grandparents came to, leaving uh, the, the lands ruled by the czar to come to the shores of the United States of America, like millions of other people from various parts of the world, you see, what I see is deeply flawed, though it has been, the United States operating with its three branches of government were actually pioneers in moving civilization forward in a very important way. Doesn't deny that we had slavery as a corrupt part of our system from the beginning and never have fully dealt with it. It doesn't, it doesn't obviate the fact that we dealt with the Native Americans here in, in a way that was completely like what the Athenians said, the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. I recognize all that darkness, but still in the spectrum of human societies that we have had in this deeply flawed civilizational system in which the spirit of the gangster has played a predominant role. This has been really pretty good. The world can look to this as having turned over a page where the, po the gov powers of the government were more an expression of the will of the people than they had been for millennia. Okay. I, I beg to differ, but that's, that's beside the point. Um, I think I think what's important for us to and I'd like you to address this because my contention is that by almost by design we are we are always uh, we 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 somewhat deify our uh, our founders right not realizing that it was really some sort of a compact among gentlemen and I can use that now a compact about around gentlemen who had a particular way that they thought gentlemen acted. Now that said, I think it is important to see all the flaws and, and recognizing the flaws is the only thing that can save us. Let's give some examples that could be fatal, okay? If we take a look at how, we, how we've allowed things like gerrymandering to take away democracy, if we look at things how an electoral college takes away democracy, if we look at all these, if we look at how the Supreme Court can be used to take away democracies. These are all fundamental parts of the, the structure of how we were created. But let's go a bit further. The American people proper, 
are good people, are honest people. They, if you take a look and you poll the American people, the American people would say the things that w- the majority of the American people now would say the things that we want, but they are they are held bent backwards by this document and following this document. Again, I bring up the three big ones, gerrymandering, electoral college, and Supreme Court. They are holding us back and they're ensuring that we don't have a real democracy, but that we have the, the, what you talk about, the powerful. Well, again, I will say the important distinction to be made is that we once had a reasonably uh, secure uh, system, which with all its flaws, nonetheless created uh, a society that people came from well, I, I, Ireland I to, and Italy. I gotta, I, Doctor, I need to interrupt you a second because I think too often, in my opinion, at least in my opinion, too often we relegate the evils that we've done to just, well, we made a few mistakes. No, no, no. I, you no, misread no, me, me if you think I, I, that. Wait, wait, hold on. I need to, I, re- I really need to get this one out because okay. I think to our audience, we have to, our audience is an audience of many, an audience that sees it in many different directions. And I think it's important for us not to look at our audience and say, well, we had this great document, we had this great system, except for we had slavery, except for we 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 uh, we genocidally killed the Indians, except for we brought over Chinese and 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 created w- w- all these exceptions as we are a great people or we we are better than everybody else. You know, you we at some point for the others that have gone through that suffering, one is going to have to say, well. Uh, you can say that, well, maybe we are great, but maybe we are great, but the other people that the but occurs to wasn't all that great. Continue, my brother. Well, you, you started this show with um, you know the, the saying about the battle between democracy and fascism. Right. You know, I've written about all those shortcomings, the, the Electoral College. I don't think I sent you that piece, but just a month ago, I had a piece in the newspapers about it. And, yeah, you know, the, the thing is that the central challenge of this moment is not between the kind of uh, problems of, of that America, whatever year you might want to choose, you could look and say there are all these kinds of profound things wrong. But we... You know, I, I grew up with Eisenhower. Was, uh, I knew Truman was president, but I didn't know much about it. But I go back a long way. And, I, you know, there was a different uh, situation in the country in terms of um, whether the United States was going to be a democracy in the future or whether it was going to become a fascistic or authoritarian state. That question has arisen over the course of the past generation. I've been working on it full time. It, it, you know, the 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 issue, um, uh, we, we, the issue that we face is how do we defeat this force? That's job one at the moment. To even get back to the level of corruption as uh, we had in the 1950s or something like that, which is plenty. Of, but you know, so to me, the, the, the reason we're uh, we're talking about the Supreme Court now is it has become a profound, more profound threat to a, a, the future of American democracy than I think that it has ever been. When it was the instrument of the slave power, it wasn't like across the board, completely indifferent to the law, at least not my understanding of the history. It was on that issue. It was an instrument of a of a of a ugly partisan force but this one this one opens the door you know it, it it hurts every time they make a decision they're hurting hurting us from our efforts to go in a good direction the, you know the, what they did to the clean air uh, clean water act uh, just uh, within the last couple of weeks you know you, they seem to go out of there. I mean, I don't know if they're going to gut the ability of the EPA to deal with climate change, but people have oh, fears. And, and people have fears of a variety of decisions they might make that will disenfranchise people. On every place you look, from Roe v. Wade to guns, and, you know, there's this whole darkness, which is, you know, when you look at fascistic powers, 
Well, you know, they say Mussolini made the trains run on time. You know, I don't know if he did or not. And, and that is a good thing. I mean, I don't like waiting at the train station either. But in general, whatever the fascistic force wants to do in the society makes it worse. Drumming up hostilities toward uh, uh, vulnerable groups of people. That's one of their perennial tricks, you know. So we've got that battle across the board. And the Supreme Court is a combatant on the wrong side. So how do we deal with it? We, do, we, do we give it respect? Because that's what Americans are supposed to do. That's a part of our culture that we give it respect. Or do we go to war against the fascistic force in that arena? In what regards go to war? What do you mean? Well, there is a congressman. Uh, that I uh, have had the privilege of advising. And I regard this guy as being the most powerful voice in the Congress for denouncing, for defending democracy and denouncing fa fascistic forces. Not necessarily using that word, but, you know. I would like to see this fellow, whom I have the greatest regard for, up the magnitude and boldness of his voice. I mean, I've been denouncing this, you know, this court in certain language here about this is bad law. This is corrupt. I, I, I'm not I'm not uh, mincing words. I'm talking about a picture of the court. What if this fellow were to step up and use his platform and his eloquence? And not just wait for them to do something, but to take it, the campaign out into the country. We've got a problem with the Supreme Court. This is not the this Supreme Court is not pl playing the function that the Supreme Court's supposed to be playing. That would be my the first thing is to bring that issue up into a public awareness to whatever extent it could, and to do it by creating events that get media attention. And having eloquent words to show in language that Americans, uh, in some general way, might be able to process. I'm not saying it's easy, but as far as you could go in being bold while still being effective, that would be the criteria. And then once the issue has been kindled in people's minds, yeah, we got a problem with the court. I mean, you can't, nobody's going to be able to do anything about the court right now, like pass a, a judicial ethics, you know. Uh, the Republicans would probably not let it come to a vote in the, in, in, in the Senate. So I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong about that. But, but the, the more the public gets activated about the issue, we've got a problem with the Supreme Court, the more room there is for the Democrats to start taking actions, political actions. I mean, people talk about adding more people to the court, which apparently, you know, the Constitution doesn't say you can't do that. Yeah, it's legal. Yeah. And I, I was reading recently about uh, FDR's attempt to, to pack the court. Which was condemned at the time, and I, you know, I've, I've known that for a long time. You know, like one of the big mistakes FDR made. He made three big mistakes in 1937. One of them was trying to pack the court. I'm not clear just why it was a, a mistake, but anyway, people say it was. But you, if the public is behind, we got to solve this problem. We don't want to give the last word to people who are morally bankrupt and are dishonest in their rendering of the so-called rendering of the law, which is really just the expression of a partisan interest. We, there are various things, not just adding more justice to the court. There's also people talk about, you know, kicking people off after 10 years or anyway, there, there are various proposals and I don't, I don't, I don't claim to know what the right strategy would be. But I do think that you got to make the American public care about it to see what the, what's at stake. If we've got, the, if the last word about the meaning of the Constitution is given to a fascistic set of people who've been appointed by a fascistic party, 
I think it becomes more possible we can actually win the battle in the Supreme Court. In addition to my being uh, I'm more optimistic about beating fascism at the polls in 2024, but that's another story. Well, it seems to me like what you're saying is if we bring some democracy into into the fold with respect to the Supreme Court, and in effect, what I think that says is I'm not even sure we need a Supreme Court. I mean, it's it's codified into the Constitution now, but I'm not uh, at this point in time. The Supreme Court, as you mentioned in the document that you sent here, is nothing but an appendage of the party. So if it's an appendage of the party. Uh, what's the what what's its use? Because well, it's but the to... thing is, but we we need to have something that gets to get the last word about a conflict. I mean, there has to be uh, somebody. You know, what if Congress says the Constitution means this, and the president says the Constitution means that? How do you resolve that? You know, you have to have Election. someone. You know, so elections. It, well, the, it's elections. But, I mean, it's true you, democracy. You can't you can't always wait for the next uh, election. And, you know, like the Civil War was about. It was about the law that we tried a conversation about this. The 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 South was not willing to uh, abide by somebody deciding the issue of whether they had a right to secede. We talked about that. It's a lawless act. The president of the United States says you have no right. They claim to have the right. You don't settle that by war. This is the thing. It's supposed to be an alternative to raw power. We're not supposed to have 10,000 bodies stacked up uh, at Antietam or Shiloh or Gettysburg. That's not how we're supposed to resolve it. We need somebody to have the last word. The South had a responsibility to go and say to the Supreme Court, here's our case for our right to secede and then have the administration. Lincoln was very eloquent uh, about why they didn't and make that case. And then the Supreme Court decides and either the South does not secede because they don't have the right to or they do secede and the government of the United States accedes to it. Somebody has to have the last word. Otherwise, the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what Professor, they must. Doctor, I mean, I, I can't disagree with you. We're coming down on time here, but I want to say something to address that I hope you can close on. And that is, um, you know, you're right. However, you know, the paradigm has changed. And now that we have a changed paradigm, uh, where, first of all, the intellect level on the Supreme Court has dropped over the years. It's no longer about understanding law. It's not no longer about understanding the reason for precedence. It's no longer about what that what you do can actually harm. As an example, Roe v. Wade will get a lot of women killed. As an example, many of the voting right strike downs that they've had will allow uh, further fascism to occur as people are going to be uh, removed from uh, being able to vote appropriately. So the damage that they've done, uh, it, it, it's long lasting and to some permanent. Um, the paradigm has changed. As a last word, how do we, what can we do in your opinion, a specific thing to do in your opinion, to take, to, to, to make a change that can help not in the long term, but now. Well, first, let me just take your phrase, the changed paradigm. It seems like this sort of characterizes some of the dynamic of, of our back and forth here. You, what you are seeing as, you know, like there was this and now there's that. And you look into the future and you want to deal with the fact that the court is that. Mm -hmm. I I see it um, not that there's been like one era and we've given way to a second era, but that we have lost ground and we now we need to regain it. So you could say that the Nazi occupied uh, France was a changed paradigm of French governance. I would say it is more illuminating to think of that as an occupied power that needs to be removed from power. 
And so what I'm eager to do is to have a restoration of the rule of law as far as we can take it, not just defeating this fascistic force that controls the court, but having dealing with gerrymandering, for example, you know, this court blocked a perfectly defensible and obviously constructive move to say that partisan gerrymandering was not consistent with the Constitution. I could make that case, and I'm not an attorney. Equal protection under the law, you know, that would be one place I would go. But they decided, no, you can't do it on account of race, and I don't. that's from leftover from a better time. But it's okay if you're going to make it so that a in a state that is 50-50 Republican Democrat, you've arranged it so it'll be 65-35 in the legislature. I mean, is that does that seem like it's consistent with the spirit of the Constitution? So in the short term, what do we do, Professor? Okay. I think people clamor as much as they can for a confrontation with this court. As bold as they're willing to be. I mean, I don't... Well, our side has never been too bold in the 25 years I've, or 30 years I've been looking at it. We've always been less bold than the occasion calls for. That's how I see it. So I think that we could have a social movement, a political movement. As much, and, and one thing, you know, this congressman that I'm talking about, I'm pitching to him that maybe we could have a way of connecting him with a following who want him to play that role, to want him to go out there and be challenging this fascistic court in whatever ways would be most effective. So that when he speaks, there is a following enough to sort of amplify, get the attention. So that's what I'm thinking of, of um, proposing to this fellow. Um, if he's interested, then the listeners of this this uh, conversation, if they're in, if they feel moved, like, yeah, I'd like to be one of those people who would make his pre or her presence felt in support of this campaign. But there are plenty of other places where democracy and fascism are, are joined, and any place that we take power away from this Republican Party is good for the survival of American democracy. But the Supreme Court is a special place because when this, this House of Representatives, it could very well be under democratic control in a year and a half. But the Supreme Court, when, they, when you get a court in a particular constellation, they say for a generation. So this is a battle we shouldn't be ignoring to, to, to en enable people like this to get the last word on all the issues that we're going to be facing over the next generation. Dr. Andy Borch Mukler, thank you once again as we continue the series, A Better Human Story. Thank you so kindly. Thank you. Morris Pearl currently serves as chair of the Patriotic Millionaires, a group of hundreds of high net worth Americans who are committed to make all Americans, including themselves, better off by building a more prosperous, stable, and inclusive nation. The group focuses on promoting public policy solutions that encourage political equality, guaranteeing a sustained wage for working Americans, and ensure that millionaires, billionaires, and corporations pay their fair share of taxes, Senor Morris Pearl, welcome to Politics and Right. How are you doing today, sir? Great to be in your show. Thank you. Doing well. Well, look, uh, this is uh, probably the third time that I've spoken to you, and each time it seems to have something to do with legislation that once again didn't take the average middle class and poor American into account. Why don't you tell me a little bit about that uh, press release that you sent out right after you realized what was going to be in the uh, this large omnibus bill that Congress is about to put forth? Sure. The part that I was talking about is the part where they adjust the rules about IRAs, individual retirement accounts, or the same idea for 401k accounts. And many people have an account 
you know, roughly half of working people in America have a retirement account. That's great. We encourage it. Uh, you know, they made it easier to sign up. That's great too, all for it. But they changed a key rule. The basic idea is that if you put money into your IRA or 401k account, you don't have to pay taxes on that money. So it's to encourage people to save. And then later, after you're retired, you take the money out and you pay taxes then at possibly a lower tax rate because you're retired. And, you know, that's okay. That sounds good. And I've saved, you know, I just, as soon as it was possible back in the 1980s, I put the maximum I could into my IRA and 401k every single paycheck. And that was great. And I was making enough money. I could afford to do that. I'd still had enough to live on. And the rule was when you were 70 or 71, you had to start taking the money out and pay taxes on it. They've changed it to make it three years later. So instead of 71, it'll be, I guess, 74. Four. That makes a huge difference. I'll have three more years, assuming I live that long, God willing, of tax-free compounding of that money. That essentially is going to make my now adult children richer by hundreds of thousands of dollars under reasonable assumptions. Of course, I could you know, live to the age of 150 and spend it all. <laughs> but assuming I don't, um, my children, who are doing great, by the way, they both have fine jobs and careers and they're doing fine, will have hundreds of thousands of more dollars, not because of anything. I do or they do just because of this change in the law about how rich people who saved up a lot of money for their retirement don't have to pay as much taxes as they used to. So it's a tax break, but this tax break, they say it's for middle class people. It's only for people of enough money. They don't need to use their retirement accounts even after they're 70 years old. Most people who save for their retirement actually need to use the savings when they're retired. It's only the very rich people who will have enough money that even after they're retired in their 70s, don't need to spend their retirement savings. And those are the people being helped by this crazy change to the law. So that's why I thought it was kind of ridiculous that Congress is in Washington there passing a change to the law, essentially, to reduce taxes for rich people. And we think that's going to make inequality even worse. The people who are already rich are going to be that little bit more rich because of this. And it's not going to do anything for the vast majority of Americans who actually have a retirement account in order to spend money when they're retired. So that's the basic gist of what I wrote about. Did I cover everything? Roberto? Yes, actually, you, let me tell you, I, 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 in a very concise manner, you sent out a press release that I loved. And you said, I'm tired of tax cuts for the rich being sold as help for the poor. That first sentence said it all. I am tired of tax cuts for the rich being sold as help for the poor. The retirement changes and omnibus package overwhelmingly benefit wealthy people like me while doing almost nothing for those who truly struggle to save for retirement. This bill does not make it easier for workers to save for retirement. It just makes it easier for high income earners to shelter more of their earnings for taxes. I mean, that's all I sure. had to read. I, I When I got the press re release, that's all I had to see. And it was like, my God, he continues to get it. It's kind of sad that so many people are just looking for ways to save on taxes. We actually, you know, one of our mottos is tax the rich because we think the rich people should pay at least the same percentage of their income in taxes as people like you who get a paycheck and with tax deduct from that every single month. I remember looking, we looked back at commercials they made in World War II when mm -hmm. they first started a lot of income taxes, they were talking about how patriotic it is to pay taxes. You know, they made a they made a, um, a, a video, a music video that said, oh, I paid for this plane just like Rockefeller did with a guy, you know, walking in front of a, you know, a, a military airplane. 
And back then, it was considered cool to pay taxes. It was the patriotic thing to do. People were proud to be helping to support their country, their nation, their people doing things collectively. And now, you know, we had a president six years ago elected who said, oh, only stupid people pay taxes. You know, and it makes no I don't sense. know. Things have changed. Now, let me ask you this, because you said something that was pr that was prescient. You said you should at least pay what the, the, av the, the percentage that um, that the average American is paying. Anyhow, of course, I think it's more. Now, we may differ in what in what we said, but uh, your your version of rich in your case, you built a store. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit about what you've done before before I get into what I want to say. It really, my my father, you know, and and family owned a bunch of clothing stores in upstate New York. They were the people that that were buying the stuff, you know, with it from, um, you know, when uh, death of and I remember in death of a salesman. So, and I spent most of my career in the banking area. Actually, I graduated from the University of Pennsylvania back in eighty two, and I spent most of my career in finance since the mid eighties until I retired about ten years ago to do. Um, basically policy advocacy full-time now. I've been doing this full-time for about eight years. And it's just ridiculous that my tax rates, because I make my money from investments, mm -hmm. are zero, 15, and 20%. Right. I pay zero up to I know, almost $100,000 a year. I'm married. I pay 15% to almost half a million dollars a year. And then I pay 20% if I need to more than that. And even that is only if I have what they call a realized gains. Right. Meaning you I have had to sold the stock and made the gains on it. Yeah. And I can withdraw tons of money from my brokerage accounts without having any realized gains. So my effective tax rate on if you say I if if you think of money, the money I'm able to spend is how much money I make. I mean, it's it's in low single digits, if anything. And it's just not right that all the burden of paying for the country or nation is put on the people who are working and the people who don't work like me, you know, are not being charged any reasonable semblance of a fair share. It's, it's interesting because yesterday I had a caller to my KPFD 90.1 FM radio show, and he said, well, you know, the IRS, if for all the rich people, because I told them that I was likely going to be speaking to you, the patriotic millionaires, and he heard of them, and he said, oh, those patriotic millionaires, they are just a bunch of hypocrites. They don't give anything or whatever. And by the way, the IRS has an address. If they want, they can just send a check. I had to explain to him that we have to look at things from a systemic nature. A, a Morris Pearl can't do it all by himself. It has to be a collective. It has to be everyone engaged in a in in, in a system of how this this operates. And I try I try to explain that to him. Now, it, it's what is it going to take for that message? I mean, I have a theory, and I don't know. You're the rich guy here. I have a theory that um, there are rich folk that works their butt off doing something positive for society and then there are those who i have i don't think you can consider anything other than psychopath if you had 10 billion dollars morris what could you possibly do why would you possibly want to gorge uh, more even though you know that commensurate with what you're pro producing in society isn't generating that you know what i think it is it's the people who get rich at that level mm -hmm. billions of dollars are people who just have such a drive to get rich that that's the thing that gives them purpose and meaning in their life. You know, the same way you might know someone who's a, you know, expert figure skater and she's just driven to get that gold medal. The guy, the only, and everyone who gets a gold medal in figure skating is like that. And the person who becomes a billionaire, well, is somebody who's, either has that kind of drive and so isn't going to change once they become a billionaire. They're going to continue that drive or more likely as someone whose grandfather or father had that kind of drive. The now, the, the what I usually say to people like that is that like, imagine we were running a country club, like a fancy golf club. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to have the dining room redecorated. 
And at the annual meeting, I stood up and gave a speech about how we should, you know, have more money to redecorate the dining room and make it fancier. And we had a, we have a vote and either the people would vote to increase the dues and have money to redecorate the dining room or they wouldn't. But you wouldn't say, oh, these few people who want to redecorate it, they should pay all the money and the rest of us should pay nothing. That wouldn't work. No one would want to be in a club that works that way. Exactly. You have to have decisions made by a democratic process with voting, not by a process of the few rich people deciding how everything should be done. And that's why we have to have decisions made of how much money we should spend on whether it's redecorating the dining room or building schools and roads and bridges and you know hospitals and all the stuff we need. Those decisions should be made by elected representatives and then the bill should be divided among all the people according to how much money they make. Makes sense That's to the me. the democratic me. process. Makes sense to me. Now, one last question before I go into the other subject, because this always bothers me, right? Um, the guy used Oprah, one of the callers used Oprah Winfrey as an example of, you know, Oprah Winfrey worth $5 billion or something, right? And I explained to him, like, first of all, I love Oprah Winfrey, and I'm happy that she owns $5 billion. But I said, that's a quirk within our economic system. I, I, I kind of explained that Oprah made her money because she could promote herself on mediums created by hundreds of thousands of engineers, intellects, and others. In other words, a microphone was invented, a camera was invented. All these other things were invented by people who got paid once. And with with what with people who got paid once, she's able to monopolize on using that medium to put her, her existence out there. It seems to me like there should be some feeling of I need to give back to a society that created these engineers and scientists who built this medium that I can that I can excel on, don't you think? Well, hey, yes, I agree with you. And I, mean, I don't I don't know Oprah personally, and I'm fine with her being a billionaire that's i mean she's done a great job we've looked through our records i mean the records like the forbes and fortune published and stuff like that she's one of three people that in the world who i could say are truly self-made billionaires mm -hmm. uh, jk rowling and um, george soros the other two Every single other person on the list, not that I checked every billionaire in the whole right, world. Right, I get it, but then aggregate. But all of the ones near the top, and most of them, are all people who started out far richer than almost all Americans did. You know, even, you know, the people who started Facebook and Apple started out having a lot more money than most people did. And having that ability of a huge head start. So I think that everybody is, you know, a lot of what you are is not because of how hard you work or how smart you are or some kind of value you have. A lot of it is where you start off in life. You know, I had the good fortune of starting off in life with, you know, family who owned a business and they could afford to send me to the finest university in the country, um, you know, and without me having to even think about how much it cost. And that gave me a huge advantage. My father and mother had a loan from the uh, that was guaranteed by the government, the Veterans Administration, at a time when that was simply not legal for Black people. It had to be in a stable neighborhood, and stable was defined as racially homogeneous. So I had huge advantages that were not available to a lot of other people. And me, and now my kids, and now my granddaughter, are doing better, at least financially, and in a lot of ways, than a typical American because of these small things that happened decades before they were born. And that's why we need to change our policies so that rich people pay at least the same tax rates, if not more, as people like you who have money deducted from your paycheck every single week. You know, let me tell you, I, I'm it's great that you're doing this work. I think more people who have the money, in other words, the rich folk, have to go out there and do it. And like I said, I think too many of them are psychopaths. It's good to see that we have those out there who are willing to just speak the truth.
Uh, Thank you, uh, uh, that That's when it, now, before we go here, I'd like to hear a little bit more about what kind of projects you're working on now, because you, it's, you always seem to have something new going. Sure. You know, one thing we're doing, we're running a sort of a long-term focus group in a small town in North Carolina, 5,000 person town. We have a few dozen people. I'm actually going to go see them personally in January, but we've been sending staff people like every couple of weeks for a while to meet with this group of people and talk to them about these exact issues and see what, if we can explain to them how their voting connects with their economic well-being and sort of make that connection for them. And this is a place that's voted for politicians who are promoting policies for more inequality and making the rich richer and their, and their poor poor. So we're going to go to a town filled with thousands of people who are, let's say, financially challenged in many cases, and we're going to see if we can talk to them and explain these things to them and see if they're going to think about how they're voting connects with the economic policies that affect their lives. Now, how so is that that's going? part of our plan. How's it going right now? And I know you should have some incremental data to kind of support if you think that that the, the economic message is starting to go against the ideological message. Well, the people that are the people that are our staff have been going there are encouraged. We're getting a lot of people to show up. Of course, we give them a some food to eat when they show up. <laughs> but um, a lot of people are showing up, and a lot of people seem to be very enthusiastic about our message. I'm going to go personally in the middle of January, and I'll report back to you um, next time we talk. That would be great. The right, you know, it's it's amazing because what you're doing in that my in that microcosm there. The right, I, I live in Kingwood, Texas, a very red area where people continue to vote against their interests, and that is, you know, how you go and you you're feeding folks as you entertain them and teach them. That's what they do here, as you know. Uh, as, as just a norm, what they always do. And it seems like those that are promoting the policies that you're talking about for a long time had not had the wherewithal to do that. So it's great that you're doing that. Yeah. I think that's going to be an excellent move in starting to change these things. But you know what my last question's always going to be, and that is, what would sure. you have liked me to ask you that I didn't? Well, I think that the patriotic millionaires are continuing to do the work we've been doing. We have a staff of a bunch of young people who are like literally younger than my kids in <laughs> many cases. And I'm just feeling encouraged to see the next generation. So I'd like you know everyone to try to address the 20 something year olds and try to see what we can do to get more young people engaged and involved in not just in their own little world, but in what they can do to sort of change the course of our nation. So that's what's getting me encouraged. Well, Morris Pearl, Chair of the Patriotic Millionaires, thank you so kindly once again for having been on Politics Done Right. Thanks, Dick Berto. Great to be in your show.